Well, it's early morning. It's 12:30, so <laughs> Friday just started. Have you been, what? Have you been to bed yet? No, 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 no. I just I got home a little while ago, so we've been staying awake for you guys. Oh, fantastic! <laughs> Thank you so much for giving us the time. Um, just fill you in a little bit about what we've been doing. Uh, we've been um, learning a little bit about conservation, environmentalism, based around a uh, film that you were in, mm -hmm. Blackfish. Um, Great. Um, done some research and we found some information from both sides of the argument um, and we are gearing towards writing some letters to some companies to ask them why Oop, hold on, you just froze there for a sec. Can you still hear me? Hello? Ha, huh, not sure if you can still hear me or not. Okay. Me? Yep. I'm here. Can um, you see me? You I got. I heard the beginning part, and then you faded out right when you were talking about contacting companies. I think. Yeah. We're going yeah. to try and write some letters to some companies to okay. um, uh, find out, uh, well, to ask them why they're still involved with Sea World. Okay. Um, That's a good idea. I like that. <laughs> and hopefully, we can ask you some questions that's going to add some weight uh, to our letters when we write them. So Great. A few questions if you'd like to ask. Okay. okay. And I can't see you guys now. Did you turn your video off? I will. Try and turn it back on if it's gone off. Okay. Is that better? Yeah, there you are. Okay. Yep. And my cat might sneak in front of the picture. She's she's really interested in what's going on. <laughs> um, before we start, would it be all right if you sort of maybe introduced yourself and your involvement um, to date? Right. Sure. Okay. So you guys all saw me in the movie Blackfish. My name's Samantha Berg, and um, I'm a former SeaWorld trainer. I actually have a degree in animal science from Cornell University. When I um, when I was in an under, when I was an undergrad when I was getting my university degree I expected to go to school to be a veterinarian and I kind of got sidetracked after I graduated from college I decided I wanted to take some time off and I had always wanted to work with uh, with either I thought either big cats or marine mammals so when I graduated from college and I wasn't ready to go right into vet school I sent resumes all over the country every place in in the U.S. that had a marine park or an aquarium. And in January of 1990, I got a letter from SeaWorld of Florida, and they invited me to come down for an interview. So um, they did not offer me, they didn't pay for me to fly down. I flew down on my own dime. And um, they basically make you take a swim test. And if you pass that swim test, which they're just, they want to see that you're physically fit. That's the most important thing. So you have to swim underwater for 25 yards. You have to dive down to the bottom of a 28-foot pool, pick up a weight. You have to do some push-ups, carry some heavy buckets, speak on a microphone. Um, they want to make sure that you look good in a wetsuit. And if you pass that test, um, then they actually do an interview. So um, I passed the swim test, I, I passed the interview, I got called back for a second interview, and then I was offered the job in the end of January of 1990, and I started working at SeaWorld in, um, in February of 1990. And I was there for three and a half years. Um, just the way things worked out the entire time I was there, I spent a year and a half at the Whale and Dolphin Stadium. So I worked with the uh, beluga whales, with the bottlenose dolphins, I walked, worked with false killer whales, Pacific white-sided dolphins. Then I was moved to the killer whale stadium, and I was there for about a year and um, and I actually um, while I was at the whale and dolphin stadium in 1991 um, that was when Tillicum killed his first victim in Victoria Canada so I was working for the company when Tillicum killed the first woman and and you saw that in the movie and so uh, the trainers knew about the death at that time but we were told that um, that it was actually an accident that she'd fallen in the pool and she was trying to get out and, um, and then the whales kept her from getting out of the water and that it was more of a drowning. Um, as you can see in the film, there's actually eyewitness reports that Tillicum was the whale responsible for pulling uh, Kelty Byrne in the water. Uh, we had no idea. I didn't find that out until, um, until David Kirby wrote his book, actually, um, Death at SeaWorld. So I didn't learn until um, until after Dawn was killed, actually, that Tillicum was responsible for the, the death of the first woman. But anyway, I spent a year at the Killer Whale Stadium. I was there when Tillicum was moved from Victoria, Canada to Orlando, Florida. And so I got to work with him. I didn't work directly with him. I worked indirectly with him for about six months. And then I was moved to the Sea Lion and Otter Stadium. And I worked with the walruses. I worked with the otters. I worked with the sea lions for another year. And I left in August of 1993. 
And so a lot of people ask, well, um, why did you leave? You know, did, was it, did you see something at that time that was really horrible? And I hate to admit it now, but it wasn't any specific thing that I saw. What I felt like was that I either needed to go back to school to become a veterinarian to do a better job helping the animals, but I recognized even back then that the facilities weren't meeting the animals' needs. And I saw what was going on in the zoological parks and aquarium world, that they were building these amazing habitats for lions, for tigers, for bears, um, places where you could, like the people would basically ride around in a cage and but the facility was was built more, like so there would be more space for the animals but I saw but yeah you know in the marine parks it was still these sterile blue pools and I felt like that was wrong so I thought well at least maybe I could go back and get my degree in some kind of uh, architectural degree or facility design and use the behavioral knowledge that I gained working at SeaWorld and and then maybe go back to the company so I expected when I left that I was going back to school and that I would go back to work for SeaWorld in some capacity I'll, I got very sidetracked <laughs> and then ended up becoming an acupuncturist and now my husband and I own an acupuncture center in Palmer, Alaska and um, I graduated from acupuncture school in 2003 and I, we've been here for about 10 years running an acupuncture center. So, um, so it was a little bit of a sidetrack but the reason I got involved in the whole um, anti-captivity issue was actually um, we just passed the five-year anniversary of Don Brancho's death. That's Tillich, that was the, you saw that in the end of Blackfish, um, that's the story where Tillicum killed a, a very experienced trainer, Don Brancho. I didn't know her personally, but um, that, that death really sparked me to go and reconsider my whole experience at SeaWorld. And I just started questioning everything that I'd seen and trying to figure out, you know, did I really, I, I basically I learned that I didn't really understand what these animals' lives were like in captivity. And I realized the whole time I was there, I never thought about how the animals were captured. Um, I didn't, I, I just assumed that they were rescued. Uh, I didn't know how, that. I didn't understand the bond that the, um, that the, that the moms have with the babies um, and that they were separate, you know, like what it actually does to the pod when you separate a baby from a mom. These are animals that can spend their entire lives together. Are you doing good on the audio? Is that? <laughs> no, no, okay. no, no. Okay. Okay. Oh, okay. So anyway, I think that so from the from the moment that Don was killed until I actually started speaking out in public about captivity, it just was a period in my life where I was questioning everything that I'd seen at SeaWorld, everything that I'd experienced. And um, I got in touch with some former other former trainers who were also in the film, uh, Jeff Venturi, Carol Ray, John Jett. And, um, and at that time, Jeff Ventry, Dr. Jeff Ventry actually, and Dr. John Jett, uh, John is a, um, he's a professor at Stetson University and, and Jeff Ventry is a, he's a physiatrist. So the two of them had been in an article that was written by a man named Tim Zimmerman for Outside Magazine. And they had talked about some stuff that they'd seen behind the scenes. I read that article and then was invited to participate in an online group that was comprised of former SeaWorld trainers, scientists, journalists, um, people who I would have considered activists back then. <laughs> and, um, and I started learning from all these people and I realized that I had known nothing about, um, about these animals and also that I was nothing more than really a circus performer. You know, I, I think that the biggest thing for me, and you heard me say this in the movie, that was that I was proud of being a SeaWorld trainer while I was there. And I think that that pride even carried over for the 17 years after I'd been there. I never questioned my experience. I didn't realize that when I graduate from, graduated from college, what I'd done was I ran off and joined the circus. I didn't see it that way. You know, I thought that I was going to a respected zoological institution that was doing genuine research. But if you look at the research that's been done over the past 50 years, I mean, maybe they've put out 50 papers, which is one a year, which is nothing compared to um, the research that's done, you know, been done on wild animals. But if you look at most of the research that they've done, none of it benefits the wild populations. The, the research that's done is mostly how can we keep these animals alive longer? How can we breed them in captivity so we can make more money off of them? So, you know, I started to see that this was basically exploitation. And, um, you know, once I saw that and I started learning more about, um, about what these animals' lives are like in the wild, um, I started to feel really bad about what I had been teaching kids like you, because I did education shows every day that I worked there. You know, we'd have thousands of kids come into the park every day with their teachers, and we would teach them what SeaWorld told us to teach the kids, but it wasn't the truth about, about these animals' lives. And, um, and I felt really awful about that, and I think that's one of the things that sparked me to want to, you know, speak out in public and just talk about what I saw. So we've got some, some questions that we'd like to ask you. Some sure. of them may ask you to go back over stuff you've already said. Oh, that's fine. Yeah. Um, so let's see. Um, which one should we start? With? Um, 
Yeah, Adisa, do you want to and ask a question? If you could change three things at SeaWorld, what would they be and why? Okay, three things. Wow. <laughs> okay, that's a really great question. Um, well, first of all, I would um, I would stop the breeding program. Um, most people think that the breeding program is somehow more humane than capturing these animals in the wild, and and I would absolutely disagree on that. Uh, these th these animals are forced to breed at ages that are way younger than they would have babies in the wild. In some cases, you know, six, seven, eight years old, when normally uh, females would have their first babies in their more like their teens, like 13, 14, 15, 16, and then they would have babies at about five-year intervals. At SeaWorld, they're bred young, and then they're forced to breed as soon as they're ready. Um, you know, two years, uh, two years after getting pregnant with their first baby, then they give birth, and they're already re inseminating them and, and forcing them to get pregnant. So to me, that's just awful. It's, it's the, and the animals don't really, because, because they're often separated from their moms early because of all the issues that go on with the social structure, they don't really even know how to be moms. So um, like there's a situation, for example, in, uh, in Laura Park, for instance, where one of the animals that gave birth, she just rejected her baby and the trainers were forced to raise the baby. And of course, the trainers were excited to take care of a baby killer whale, but a baby killer whale needs its mom. It doesn't need trainers taking care of them. So, so that's one particular situation. Number two, um, I, would, I would actually have the company educate kids about what, or educate the public, people who come through, about what these animals are really like, what their lives are like in the wild, um, talk about what's really going on in the oceans, and, and, um, and use their, I guess I, the way I would put it is, I think they should use their powers for good. So I think, that edu I think they have the opportunity to, edu to educate people and to help people become more interested in real conservation, encourage kids to become scientists or marine biologists or environmental conservationists, not to become trainers. So I think, I think one of the things that they do with their shows is they make it seem really interesting and fun and exciting to become an animal trainer. Oh boy, I want to swim with the whale. You know, I want to swim with the dolphin. I want to do tricks. I want to make the dolphin or the whale do tricks. But they're teaching kids how to dominate these animals. They're not, they're not really teaching them respect for the animals in the wild and respect for their natural environment. They're, they're, teaching, them, um, they're, they're teaching them basically how to, how to dominate and, um, and abuse these animals for money. You know, that's, how, that's how I see it. So that's another thing. And then the third thing, honestly, is I would shut down the shows. And I would, um, it, each, this is a little bit tricky because a lot of people are like, oh yeah, free the whales, you know, and as much as I would like to see some of these animals get back into the ocean, unfortunately, it's not possible for all of them. Only six of SeaWorld's killer whales and their entire population have been captured from the wild and the rest of them have been born in captivity. So the captive born animals don't really have a pod to go back into and we can talk about that a little bit more but the best probably for them might be a sea pen situation where they're, they're in an, an ocean pen so it would be a cove in an ocean with a net across it so they're in a more natural environment they can hear the sounds of the ocean um, they can interact with fish you know but they'd still probably need trainers to monitor them for the rest of their lives but they wouldn't be forced to do shows. And then there are some animals that are in captivity right now who might be good candidates for release. Um, has anybody in the audience seen the movie Free Willy? Do you guys know about that? It's from, yeah, a few of you guys. Okay, so um, the whale in Free Willy, his name was Keiko, and he was living in a very tiny pool in Mexico, and he was very sick. He was 2,500 pounds under, underweight. He had a virus, uh, very unhealthy. And after being in the movie Free Willy, kids from all over the world started sending in pennies and they collected thousands of dollars and then they had a, a, a guy who was a, um, had made his money in the cell phone industry um, donate money and eventually they collected enough money to move Keiko from this tiny pool in Mexico then to a uh, um, to a facility in Oregon that they built specifically for him where they gave him colder water and more room to swim around in. And, um, and they got his weight back up, they got him healthy, and eventually he was moved to Iceland where he started to learn to swim on his own and eventually he swam from Iceland to Norway on his own. He did die in the wild, but he would have died in Mexico probably years earlier if he hadn't been taken out. So that's really the only example of where, that we have of a killer whale being rehabbed to go back out into the wild. But unfortunately for Keiko, 
um, they never were able to reunite him with his family. Now there's one whale in Florida, her name's Lolita, she's at Marine Land in Florida, or sorry, she's at the Miami Sea Aquarium in, in Florida, and she's not a SeaWorld whale, but she's been in captivity for, um, for about 44 years now, and you saw a little bit of the footage of her being, her and her family being captured in the early part of Blackfish. So she is the only surviving animal from those captures off the San Juan Islands. She's one of the southern residents, and she just actually, um, a ruling just came down through the U.S. government that she's now considered endangered along with um, with her um, with her family so we know where her family is and she's also now considered endangered so that kind of opens up a, a step to maybe return her to her family in the wild um, it would be a long shot and I don't know that she'd ever get it's possible though that she could go out and that what Lolita has going for her is unlike some of the SeaWorld whales that have um, really bad teeth and because um, they've been uh, because they've been in populations of animals and you saw this in the movie where they don't get along with each other and they fight so they break their teeth or they have these um, behaviors where they chew on the side of the pool or they chew on the gates. Lolita's teeth are actually very healthy. She's in pretty good shape physically and um, and she and they know where her family is and she can actually respond to her family's calls. So there's actually a good chance that um, that Lolita at least could be returned to a sea pen and possibly even reintegrated with her family. Um, there are some reports that, he, that definitely she's got brothers and sisters alive in the wild but possibly her mom is even alive in the wild so that is you know that's the best case scenario and not every whale is eligible for that but at the very least I would love to see it if they would it, shut down the shows stop forcing the animals to perform not breed any more animals and um, and the animals that can be released and rehabbed get them to a situation that is give them more space than they have because they really they have such a small amount of space compared to what they would get in the wild Okay. I, I got why what are your thoughts about Tilikum now that he's been involved? What was the first part of the question? Um do you want to come back over actually? <laughs> Oh. What do you think that Tim comes to kill him? What are your thoughts about Tim coming up and his involved in this incident? Okay. So, so is what, um, what do I think? Why do I think that he killed one of his trainers? Um, you know, it's one of those questions where so many people have speculated why would this animal kill a trainer? Um, I honestly think the first time. If you look at the situation that Tillicum was in, he was in um, he was in a very tiny pool. He was with two females that he didn't know very well, and he was what they call the subdominant animal. Um, in killer whale societies, they're matriarchal, and so the males tend to be sort of on the periphery, of, and meaning like he wasn't really. Um, the two females were basically in charge, and and he was the underdog. So they often beat him up. Um, they were. He was also forced in this facility in Victoria, Canada, to live. Um, and you saw this in the movie in that tiny little space called the module. And so think about his size, and think about the space that he was used to, and think about how frustrating that might have been for him, and how bored that would be to be, you know, alone in the dark or forced to be with these animals that were that were basically beating him up all the time. So I think there was an aspect of frustration and boredom that happened, and I think it was sort of opportunistic. You know, this from from what I understand now. Kelty Byrne um, slipped and fell in the water and she was trying to get back out and then Tillicum grabbed her and pulled her back in and then I think at that point it was a very um, exciting or stimulating event for these animals It didn't have a lot of stimulation. So I don't know that they knew because they didn't do water work with their animals at, um, at Sea Land of the Pacific the way they do in, in Florida and all the SeaWorld parks actually train their killer whales to understand what it means to have a person in the water and there are all these safety protocols that are, that are utilized at, at Sea Land of the Pacific in Victoria. They didn't have these protocols so I don't really know that the whales were, um, you know, were they aware that they were killing this person? I'm not sure, and again, we'll never know. But I also know that Tillicum, because he was subdominant, when he got a toy, he didn't let it go, and because the females would get it. So I think, you know, he got he got a hold of Kelty, and you know, in the end, apparently, he was the one that was holding Kelty, and they had to remove her body from, you know, from from his. You know, she was like draped over him. So um, that's, you know, my that's what I guess on the first death. Again, I wasn't there, and I don't really know. But you know, from what I've read and what I've heard. Um, you know, probably started out as an accident. Um, then there's the second death, which is the guy we saw in the movie, Daniel Dukes, who um, he uh, 
he he stayed after hours in the park and um, unfortunately uh, you know, either he jumped in the water with Tilikum or, you know, we don't know what happened because despite the fact that there are cameras all over the park, nobody, nobody claims to have seen anything. Although I can tell you that I used to do night watch at Shamu Stadium and one of my, one of my jobs is a night watch trainer and they never, they always had night watch trainers on. One of your jobs is to walk around the pool every hour and count how many times the whales breathe for up for five minutes. And so between the time that this guy got in the water at midnight and the time that they found him at seven in the morning, that's basically saying that nobody looked at Tilikum for seven hours. So I don't believe that. <laughs> but anyway, you know, for as far as we're concerned, there's no video, so we don't know what happened. So again, um, you know, my, if I had to guess, I would say it's very possible that he, um, he got close to the side of the pool where Tilikum was. And again, Tilikum was kind of bored and he might've been dipping his hand in the water or his leg in the water and Tilikum could have pulled him in, or he could have jumped in the water. It's, it's just we'll never know. But again, um, I think because of the situation that he'd had with Kelty, because it was so stimulating and interesting for him, that he probably did a similar thing. And we know that the second guy, he he he, um, there was there was definitely some physical damage to his body, and you saw that in the movie. The third trainer, um, Don Brancho. Again, if you watch the video footage leading up to um, when she was pulled in the water there's a likelihood that he was also highly frustrated and um, you know there there and we hear I, again I don't know this for sure but um, potentially there was some VIPs in the audience she might have been trying to do a longer show um, there's so many factors that can go on there was a there was a, a there was an altercation between some other whales in the main show pool before he pulled her in and so whenever because those environments these are very auditory animals so they know exactly what's going on in the pool even if they can't see so if a couple of other animals were stressed and frustrated he could have easily been stressed and frustrated he can see what's going on through the gate or he can hear sounds so there's so many factors that could have contributed to it but the thing is um, the fact that he was allowed to have that proximity to a trainer after having been involved in the deaths of two other people before to me that's where you have the mistake that's why I don't see it as an accident. Um, on the part of the sea, of SeaWorld management, I don't see it as an accident. To me, that's a train wreck that was happening for 20 years. You know, I think there was, after the second person was killed, he never should have been allowed to be in that proximity to anybody. Because he was, and if you think about it, if he'd been a polar bear at a zoo, and if he'd killed somebody or a lion at a zoo who'd killed somebody, that there, he never would have had access to another person. So in the end, the question was, what do I think of Tilikum now? I feel sorry for him. I don't hold him responsible. I hold, you know, I, I hold the company responsible for him. And the, the decision to continue allowing him to have access to people for all those years after killing even one person um, tells me that their focus was not about his health and safety or the health and safety of the trainers. It, it was really about making money. Again, as you saw in the movie, this animal is, he's uh, at, I don't know how many now, but at the time the movie was made, over 50% of the animals in SeaWorld's collection were related to Tilikum. So he's their father. So they're not only using him as a show animal, but they're using him as their main breeder. So I think that's highly irresponsible too. But, you know, I just, I honestly feel bad for him and I wish there was something that we could do to make his life better. You know, if there's any way we could, we could at least give him a larger enclosure and get him so, to some semblance of a normal environment, that would be wonderful. But I don't, I don't hold him responsible and I don't, I don't wish any ill towards Tilikum. Yeah, brilliant. That was a, that was a good question. That was something we'd all wondered about. Mm -hmm. how the trainers felt about it. Yeah, I think most people, um, you know, when I when I saw him, again, I didn't work directly with him, but I observed a lot of sessions with him. And it's ironic because people think, well, he must have been really frightening or scary to work with. And actually, because I think he was so starved for attention at his, at his first facility that he was at, and I found out since the movie was made for a couple of years even, he was held in isolation before he even got to the Victoria facility. So I think he was starved for attention. And I think he, he really seemed to want to interact with the trainers. And most people who, who interacted with him, I think you hear John Jett say it in the movie too. I mean, we thought he was... He was uh, he was a rather friendly and interactive animal. Like he didn't, he didn't come off as an aggressive animal. So it's not like um, there were necessarily signals given. You know, when you're around an aggressive dog or even a cat that's aggressive, like they give you signals. Their ears are back. They're growling at you. That's not. You know, Tilikum did not. I mean, he did lunge at trainers for sure, and he has a history of aggression in his um, in his pro in his animal profile at SeaWorld. But yet, overall, in terms of his personality, uh, you know, I would say that he was one of the kind of sweeter natured animals to work with. It's just that his, because of what had happened in his history, I think it just sort of set him up to be an animal that should never have had the opportunity to get close to a trainer like he did.
nervous. <laughs> So that was how to how do we make the orcas perform tricks and then do I think they enjoy it? Is that it? Okay. So basically the, the question is is how do you how do you train the animals? And so the animals are trained through a process called operant conditioning. And what SeaWorld likes to say is that operant conditioning does not involve punishment, it's only positive reinforcement. And so I will tell you a little bit, tell me if, if, and if this gets complicated, please feel free to raise your hand. I'll try to make it as simple as possible. But it's basically, um, and I'll tell you what SeaWorld says and then I'll tell you my opinion on it. But um, what SeaWorld says is they only train the animals via basically a reward system. And so, um, so you train an animal um, by steps. There's what are called approximations. And so one of the most basic things that you might train an animal would be to do something called come to a hand target. So what you would do is put your hand out, and then the animal would put its nose or its rostrum on your hand and touch your hand. So you give them a signal, and then they touch your hand. And then you notice the trainers have the whistle in their mouths. So the animal does the right thing, and they blow the whistle. And that says, oh, you did a good thing. You touched my hand. And then right after they hear the whistle, then they get, um, then they get some food. So, so basically what you just saw was I put my hand out, the animal said, oh, I think I'll touch your hand. They don't necessarily know that's what you want, but maybe they touch your hand. They've learned already that when you blow the whistle, it means I get food. Because you've actually taken a step before that to, you teach them, you blow the whistle, give them a fish, blow the whistle, give them a fish, blow the whistle, give them a fish. They're very smart. They figure that out very fast. It's just like, a, anybody ever done clicker training with a dog? In the audience, anybody ever trained a dog? No, okay. So you're teaching the animal that um, they hear this noise, they get a reward. So very simple. And um, so um, once you've trained an animal to come to a hand target, you can actually extend that uh, that target out. So you can move your hand around and say, "Now touch my hand here." blow the whistle, they get a fish. Move my hand here, blow the whistle, they get a fish. Eventually you can start teaching them on it. You probably, you might have seen some video footage of an animal being trained with a target pole. And so now you're sort of extending your reach. You've got a pole with a little, um, with a little styrofoam ball on it. And you teach the animal to touch the tip of that. And then you blow the whistle and they get a fish. And then let's say now you want them to do, um, you want them to do a, um, a somersault. So first thing you're going to do is have the animal touch the ball and you're going to move that target around and if they stay touching it as you move it, you're going to blow the whistle and you're going to give them a fish. <laughs> and so you can see that's called approximations. You're shaping this behavior. Eventually as they follow the target, pull around and they'll make the circle and then you'll blow the whistle and you give them a fish. Now let's say you want them to do that somersault but you want them to do it out of the water. So you can kind of see where I'm going. You just, you just slowly shape the behavior that you want over time. And these animals are so smart, they, they, they pick it up pretty quickly. So that's if the animal's doing something correctly. So if they do the right thing, you blow the whistle, they get a reward. Um, that's sort of step one. Um, let's say they do the wrong thing. And um, it, at the SeaWorld training method is that if they do the wrong thing, you don't hit them over the head with the pole. <laughs> you, um, you just actually give what's called a three-second neutral response. So what that means is that you, let's say you put your hand out and the animal doesn't touch your hand. Um, you don't yell at it or kick it or try it or hit it. You just wait for a sec. You just ignore the fact that they've done the wrong thing and then you try it again. And if they do the right thing, then they get a reward. So it's not technically punishment, like they're not, they're not being, but, but they eventually learn to understand that when you ignore them for that three seconds for not doing the right thing, that they've done the wrong thing. So at a, at a certain point, you, you start actually telling the animal, um, okay, you've done the wrong thing, but if, you, if you're good and you just sit there and wait for the three seconds, and then you come back to me and we continue on with the session, then you, that you can also get rewarded for that. So you can see it gets a little bit complicated. <laughs> and then a reward, there's the question is, what is actually a reward for what particular animal? So early on, when you're teaching an animal, you want to be really clear, and you use what's called primary reinforcement, and that's going to be a fish. <laughs> primary reinforcement is something that they instinctively get is, is, you know, is reinforcing. They're hungry, they get a fish. Um, eventually, when um, the animals that are, have been trained for a long time, you don't have, it's not like a one, one-to-one -one relationship. You don't just do behavior, fish, behavior, fish, behavior, fish. You do, um, they do something, they, they hear the whistle, then they get another behavior. And that tells them actually they did the first behavior right. And then maybe they get a rub down or they get their favorite toy. So you can start linking behaviors together in a chain. And honestly, the reason SeaWorld does that is because it looks better from an audience standpoint. 
It's not quite as clear for the animals, but eventually they do get it. It looks better from the audience standpoint if every time an animal does a behavior, they're not coming back to stage to get a fish. <laughs> so um, basically the idea is that you're teaching the animals that when they do something correctly, they get a reward. And when they do something incorrectly, they, they get a neutral response. And so SeaWorld calls that positive reinforcement. However, in order to get the animals to perform day in and day out, and in some cases seven shows a day, at the Sea Lion and Otter Stadium, you know, eight or nine shows a day, you have to spread out the amount of food that you're giving them over a long period of time. And in, this, in, the, in the case of the killer whales, these are animals that eat several hundred pounds of food a day. So even if they're getting all of their base, let's say they're, you know, they're supposed to get 250 pounds of food a day, even if they're getting that from seven o'clock in the morning to 10 o'clock at night, they're still going around hungry. So you got to think about that for a sec. So, um, you know, SeaWorld says we don't deprive the, the animals of food, but because of the way they're doling it out throughout the day, and sometimes if there's a, um, if there's a special show that they want to get, they want to make sure the animals perform really well, they'll actually hold back and not give them as much food early on in the day, and they'll give them more food later in the day. So to me, that seems like food deprivation. You know, again, it's, it, you know, SeaWorld wouldn't describe it that way, but I see it that way now when, when you consider, again, how much they actually eat. And so they're constantly feeling hungry and of course if they're hungry they're going to perform better you know and SeaWorld says oh well it's not about the food it's about the relationship that the trainer develops with the animal and that's why the animals perform um, you know and that goes to the question of do they enjoy it again I think that this is a very boring environment for them and I think that doing shows and doing training sessions is probably more interesting than swimming slow circles around or just you know kind of surface resting in front of a gate sure it's more interesting and um, you know, much better than doing nothing. But do I think that they really like it compared to swimming in the wild with their family and being able to swim, you know, a hundred miles a day? No. <laughs> so I think that's really again, it's like the the question for them is like, yes, it's probably better than doing nothing. Um, but I don't think that it. I think I don't think that um, that that doing shows and performing for people and getting to interact with the trainer is um, is anything compared to what their needs are in the wild and what I would compare it to is you guys probably haven't heard this term but Stockholm syndrome which is a syndrome which is basically a reference to there's like a prisoner and a prison guard and the prison guard is the person who's responsible for giving everything to the prisoner that they need so of course the prisoner wants to please the prison guard and of course, the prisoner seems to be happier when the prison guard comes around because they're the one that gives them everything that they need. So the appearance is of a relationship. But what it actually is is that the prisoner is so dependent on the prison guard for everything that, um, you know, that of course they want to they perform, they want to please, they want their food, they want their toys, they, they want to not be bored. But is that healthy? I, I would say no. That was a great question, by the way. Okay, I didn't hear it. Stay there. <laughs> I didn't actually, that kind of got blurred. Try one more time. How were the whales transported from the sea to sea where they are more affected to have a death? Uh, I kept cutting out, so try it. Yeah, so how, how were the whales transported from the sea to sea world? Oh, okay. The movement of whales around has on Oh, okay. So you saw a little bit of that in the movie. Um, depending on the animal, uh, they once they capture the animal, they put them in a stretcher. And there's special stretchers that are made so that their pectoral flippers on the side of their body, there's little holes that they stick through. And so they once they've got um, once they've got them in an environment where they were, and it takes a lot of people with a killer whale, even for baby killer whale. But the trainers would get in the water and they would move the animal onto the stretcher that is uh, that is hung off a crane. And so once they've positioned the animal in the stretcher, then they would lift the animal out of the water by crane. And so, and then they would be moved from the ocean to, it's basically a transport box. So it's a big box that has water in it. And so they, they lower the animal in the stretcher into the box that has water in it. Now that's if they're lucky. I know that there's some transports that are not done exactly like that. Sometimes I know at the, in Taiji in the cove, sometimes these animals are lowered on the stretcher onto like a, a mat or padding, you know, and taken away in the back of a truck. So, but let's say they're doing it right. They're putting them, at least they're, because these animals are so heavy, they can't, their bodies can't really support their weight 
in, in air, they actually need to be in, in water or they're, um, it can be really un unhealthy for them to like, that's why one of the reasons animals die when they're beached is because that pressure of their body starts to pull blood underneath them and their circulation doesn't work right and they get overheated. But let's just say they're doing it right. The animal's lifted up in the stretcher. They're then taken in the stretcher and they're dropped into this box that has water in it. And then depending on how far they go, that box then can go on the back of a truck. And then that box can be taken to an airplane and they have special airplanes that are basically these large transport planes where the box is then taken off of the off of the truck it's slid onto the airplane and then the airplane flies to wherever it's going and generally there will be trainers with the animal the whole time you know and veterinarians monitoring the health of the animal um, and then they get to you know they, they get to their destination and the whole thing repeats in the other direction they slide the box out the box goes onto a truck they get to their destination they lift them out in the crane and they put them in the water so highly stressful really this this is and and they've measured this there's been there's been studies looking at stress hormones in these animals and it's and it's sometimes they don't necessarily die right away from the transport but it's so stressful for them that you know even months later they can be dealing with the effects of stress in fact that was one of the arguments um i don't know if if you guys were paying attention to it at all but a few years ago uh, SeaWorld and the Georgia Aquarium and I think it's the Mystic Aquarium had a request to import 18 wild caught beluga whales from Russia and one of the arguments against that the, the animals had already been caught they'd actually there there's some really good evidence that they'd taken too many animals from this one particular pod but one of the most compelling reasons why I think the permit was denied for them, for um, for these animals to be transported from Russia to the U.S. was because the way the the transport itself was going to take over 50 something hours, and we heard testimony from a pilot who was looking at the logistics of this transport and getting them from point A to point B from from Russia, and then um, having to go through Belgium and then getting to their getting to the U.S. and then moving around to the to their destination in the U.S. It was going to be over 50 hours of of transport for these animals, and plus the um, there was an issue at the time where the Russian planes couldn't land in the U.S. The U.S. planes couldn't land in Russia, so that's where they had an intermediate in Belgium. And in Belgium, they're going to take them off one plane and put them on another plane. And the Russian planes are really loud. So, I mean, if you think about that, just think how terrifying that would be if a giant crane just came down out of the sky right now and just plucked you up out of your out of your um, environment and, you know, set you down on Mars. <laughs> I, I think that's kind of, I just, I don't know that they understand what's going on. You know, it's just loud noise, it's movement, they're feeling weight that they haven't felt before. You know, they're not eating or they're not, you know, they're all of a sudden uh, um, just subjected to all sorts of stresses that they wouldn't be subjected to in their natural environment. So I think it's highly stressful for them and it's one of the places where they're most likely to lose animals is, you know, the capture is one and then the second thing is the transport. So I know that they're monitored very closely when they get to where they're going. Yeah, perfect question. Yeah, we've got maybe one more question. Okay. Is that okay? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Come on, Emma, huge voice. Do you think SeaWorld should be closed down? And if so, do you have any thoughts about how we can make this happen? What, the last part, do I have any thoughts about? How okay. we can make this happen. Okay, <laughs> so um, the short answer is, you know, if SeaWorld closes down, um, you know, what are we going to, what's going to happen with the whales? I honestly don't think that, um, I think the way they're going right now, unfortunately, it could end up that way. So I personally just want to see them change their business model. You know, I, I really don't, you know, I'm, I'm actually not anti SeaWorld. You know, I didn't start out in this to, to go, I'm not out to get SeaWorld. I just think after 50 years of keeping these animals in captivity, we have, we know so many animals have died. They live such, you know, shortened, impoverished lives. We know already, we know better. We know that, that they don't thrive in captivity. There are certain animals that just don't do well and killer whales, especially, but you know, dolphins, sea lions, otters, uh, walruses. I mean, these animals just don't belong in captivity anymore. More. But to say, oh yeah, SeaWorld should, should shut down, well, they're the ones that have the veterinary expertise, they actually have the money, they have the facilities for rehab, you know, so, so what I think should happen is that SeaWorld should transition to, like I said, an educational facility. Um, one of the things I didn't send you guys is there's a great video of, of uh, virtual underwater whale watching. And so uh, it's, it's, a, um, it's a Japanese company that's taken all the whales of the world, they've turned them into CGI. And I think, you know, maybe who knows what the cost is, but they're, they're able to generate these CGI images that when you see them 
they, um, they project them in a dark room on a huge uh, wall. So it looks like you're in the ocean with the whales and they're interactive. So you can actually go up to the wall and you know you can turn around and the whale will spin and you can wave and the whale will wave at you and um, and you can see you can see all these animals and it looks real and you get the experience of interacting with the animals in the ocean but you're not harming any animals. So I feel like there's so many cool things going on with technology right now and like I'll send you that video as soon as we're done so you guys can watch it because I think it's it's pretty powerful to see what's possible and if you think about it even you could do virtual dissections you, know, you could look inside of the whales with the with the CGI um, there's so many cool things that you could do with technology today that there's no reason to have live animals in captivity anymore you know there's there's video there's audio you could have um, hydrophones all over the world and a place like SeaWorld could have an announcement over their over their uh, park um, loudspeakers like now we're hearing whales from Australia and they can just pipe that sound through the through the whole park you know or they could have visiting researchers who are coming in to actually talk about the research that they're doing and present their papers but um, here's the thing is that SeaWorld was and and they're the one of the C, the previous CEO from 1988 there's a quote from him saying that SeaWorld was never meant to be an educational um, institution it was always about entertainment it was always about a circus. And so you have a company that's been based on um, exploiting animals for entertainment, and that's their business model. And then in 1980, um, and then in um, 1988, they were basically forced to change that business model in order to keep going. They were told, well, you have to offer education to the public. So they said, okay, now we're offering education. <laughs> and they basically re retold their, um, their entertainment shows and they have little bits of education in it, but really it's not, it's not really education that's, um, that I would, I would say is worthwhile. You can get more education about whales in five minutes on the internet than you can get spending a, a day at SeaWorld. So so um, ultimately what I think they need to do is, is change their business model and respond to the public pressure that they're getting. I think a lot of, I think people are speaking with their dollars now. They just had their fourth quarter earnings come out and I think they lost like another $24.5 million US. So people are saying, we don't want to see this kind of entertainment anymore. We don't think it's okay. So I think I, I kind of, that's the way I would like to see it go. But unfortunately what we are seeing over the past five years instead of them being willing to change, they fought tooth and nail to keep their current business model and they're also trying to export it to Russia and China now. So they are, they're trying to have facilities in Russia and China where they do the same thing. It's the same trick. The, the tricks have not changed. The business model has not changed. So if that's what they're gonna do, then yeah, I do think they need to close. But um, I would hope that um, that a new they would get they would get new management in there who could see who'd be a little bit more forward thinking and realize they could be an incredible educational facility. They they could use their facilities also to rehab animals because there are animals that are injured in the wild that can't go back to the wild. And so it wouldn't be like there wouldn't be plenty of jobs for people to take care of these animals. But they don't need to present them in these circus style shows anymore. It's just not, I mean, I think that everybody can pretty much agree that seeing a whale jump through a hoop is, is um, you know, although it's, it's a spectacle, but it's not the same as going out in a whale watch boat and watching a pod of whales, you know, swim normally in the wild or, you know, watching a pod of whales, you know, attack a sea lion or, you know, watching, a, um, you know, some humpback whales while they do bubble net feeding. I mean, it's so much more amazing to see these animals in their natural habitat. And again, I'd like to see them promote real conservation and, um, and, and really teach people because, um, you know, if we don't do something and it's your generation, unfortunately, I hate to drop it in your lap, but you guys are the ones that are going <laughs> to, you're going to need to do something because uh, the oceans are in pretty bad shape right now. And, um, and I think one of the things that, they, that um, has been studied is that people that go to SeaWorld think that just by paying their money to go to the park, that somehow they've done their bit for conservation because SeaWorld contributes to conservation. But the percentage that they contribute from their total um, net income or from their total gross income is such a small percentage. It would be like um, a university professor giving like 17 cents a year, <laughs> or maybe it's $17 a year, but it's still not very much. So. Um, I think that they really need to um, te need to teach people about conservation and, and give people the story about what's really happening right now. And so, and I I disagree with their. They say that in order to care about these animals, you have to see them up close and personal. But it's absolutely not true. And you know, my favorite argument about that is like, how many of you guys are really interested in dinosaurs or fascinated by dinosaurs? 
And have you ever seen one except on the internet or in a book <laughs> or in a, you know, in a CGI movie, you know, and, and so you probably know way more about dinosaurs than you know about whales. And, you know, nobody actually saw a live one. So I, I think that argument is old, but they like to, they like to pull that one out and kind of tug at people's heartstrings and it's not true anymore. Um, well, can I just say a massive, massive thank you. Sure. Really <laughs> um, for all of us to, to talk to you. Uh, and thank you for staying up late and giving us so much of your time. Sure, you're um, welcome. So we will just say a big thank you, please. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, guys. You're a great audience. So, um, well, we'll hopefully be in touch and maybe um, show you some examples of okay. what we come up with All right. um, to send off to some, some of these companies that are involved yep. in the well. That would be awesome. Um, and I'll send you the virtual whale watching link so you guys can watch that. Um, and again, thank you very much and get some sleep. Okay. <laughs> All right. Have a good night, you guys. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.